This is unprecedented. The streetcar shut down for a third straight week. What on earth is happening? And when will it be back? We go straight to the echelon of power and bring you the streetcar's top leadership this half hour. Plus, in our reporter roundtable, how did we do in what some say was the most damaging storm in 20 years? Could we have done better? A storm report card on the way. Plus, finally pulling the plug on Mission Gateway. We have been humiliated and disrespected. That has been the laughing stock of this county since it went up. Those stories and the rest of the week's news straight ahead. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of AARP Kansas City, RSM, Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlise Gorley, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, the restaurant at 1900, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome, I'm Nick Haynes. We have a storm report card for you and a look at the rest of the week's most impactful, confusing and befuddling local headlines. But first, what on earth is happening with Kansas City's seven-year-old streetcar system? It's been shut down since the 4th of July. Could it be imminently reopening? Is, and is there more to the story than we're being told? And when will it be back? We're going to find out. We can talk to reporters about the problem or talk to those in charge around the cozy confines of our Week in Review table is Donna Mann with the Kansas City Streetcar Authority and the executive director of the streetcar, Tom Guerin. Thank you so much for being with us. But let me ask you this, first of all. This started on the 4th of July. Many of us were having parties. We were lighting up fireworks. I'm assuming you might have been home with your family on that day. So you get a call and to say that there's a bit of steel popping out from the track. Did you think this was going to be just a small issue or, or did you know right then? that this was going to be something much more massive that was going to take weeks to repair. Yeah, we knew pretty quickly after the operators did their job to identify the hazard that we would be uh, spending a little bit of time getting back up and running, yes. But over two weeks? Yeah, we, we knew within 24 hours that we were looking at between a two to three week time frame to do everything that we felt like we needed to do to make not just the one rail that, that failed right, but correct other issues and other uh, and other needs within the bridge itself. Yeah. Yeah. For those of us who do not have engineering degrees and don't subscribe to engineering magazines, can you in a nutshell tell us what the problem actually was, Tom? Yes, it was really an issue of thermal expansion. We had too much rail in the street. The pressure of the heat caused the rail to expand. It deteriorated some of the track slab, uh, some of the material that was holding that rail, rail in place, and it, and it gave way and elevated. You know, Donna, we've seen this uh, photographs from your own um, social media accounts. Um, we see cement being poured into that section. It was on that I-670 bridge that crosscuts uh, Kansas City. Has all the work been centered for the last two weeks on that one spot? Have you been doing the same work in other parts of the two-mile line? So we've taken this opportunity while we're out of service and repairing the bridge to look at the rest of our line and see if there is preventative maintenance that needs to happen. So it's actually taking an opportunity to look at everything and, and do some touch-ups in other areas. So what does this do to the Main Street line? I mean, that is supposed to be happening. All of the focus has been on that. We're going to be going down to the plaza and on to UMKC. Has that timeline, Tom, now changed no. as a result of this? No, not at all. Main Street is moving forward. We're 50 percent constructed now on that project, making great progress as we march to, to opening in 2025. Are you doing anything differently in terms of the construction of that as a result of the problems you experienced? Well, not on the as a result of, of the problems, but we did observe early challenges and some deterioration, and there were some opportunities for improvement on the downtown design that we embedded into Main Street. So we're going to have a thicker track slab, we're going to have reinforced uh, concrete, we're going to have additional rebar, we're even going to have a different rail. A section type of rail in in the majority of the Main Street extension so all lessons learned from early observations uh, before this failure that we've been able to incorporate from the beginning of the Main Street extension so we feel great about the direction can you just refresh our memory Donna as to when this new extension down to the plaza on UMKC is expected to open oh we'll be ready to ride in 2025 Nick but no specific date 
Not yet. Too, too nervous to say a no, specific date? Okay. We're going to be done with the majority of the construction on, on Main Street over the course of uh, 2024. And by the end of 2024, we think we'll be testing streetcar vehicles up and down Main Street with an opening in 2025 after testing, you know, safety commissioning and all of the processes and steps we have to go through to train not just um, the current staff, but we're going to be more than doubling the workforce of the system to hire maintainers, hire uh, operators, supervisors to help not just you know, obviously build it, but to operate and maintain it at a high level going forward. So we've got a, a big hill to climb on that front. The last time you were around this table, Tom, uh, we were talking about a study on an east-west yes. potential corridor that would go from the University of Kansas Hospital all the way to the Truman Sports Complex. Since then, we've been told that that project has been shelled. It was going to cost too much money. So you're not studying that anymore? No, that's not true, okay. actually. The, the, our partners at, at KCATA, uh, with a, a consortium of others, including the streetcar authority, have received a four and a half million dollar raise grant to advance the next phase of the east-west transit study where we're looking at east-west connectivity. So we need to keep making progress on developing plans, getting projects in the pipeline, accessing federal money uh, that might be available through the current infrastructure bill or future, and keep charting the course. These projects take a long time. As we know, the Main Street project, when we started, to when we think we'll open is almost a 10 year time horizon. These are generational investments for our city that are gonna reconnect us in a fundamentally different way and they don't come easy. It takes a lot of work and uh, the work is continuing on the east-west extension. We think it's vitally important, not just for our city, but for our region to have an east-west spine just like we have uh, in our building a north-south spine. Daughter, it doesn't get as much attention, but there is also nudging forward on the north of a, a smaller line that will actually go all the way to the KC Current Stadium being built on the riverfront. When is that supposed to open? So our goal on that is that it's currently 100% designed, hopefully to get into construction later this year. Um, and yeah, it'll be steps away from the KC Current uh, Stadium. So if you're doing it to the stadium, are you in talks with John Sherman, the head of the Royals, Tom, to say, OK, we want to build a streetcar line to your new stadium, whether it be in a downtown spot or in North Kansas City? Yeah, we're not in contact with not, John not Sherman. At all? Okay. Not at all. But uh, we're excited about downtown baseball, and we look forward to the opportunity, uh, regardless, to shuttle thousands of people and create economic activity in the heart of, of our the heart of downtown in the heart of our region there was a recent rfp a request for proposals from the city mm -hmm. to actually have new transportation now from our brand new airport terminal to downtown particularly with the world cup coming to town in 2026 in fact the deadline for those rfps is actually today did uh, the streetcar submit a bid as no, part of that effort no we did not but we're supporting the city's efforts in the in the solicitation and the call for interest Streetcar is not a uh, solution for all transit problems in the region, and we vitally need a higher capacity, high quality connection connecting what we're building in the spine of the streetcar system in the heart of our region to the new terminal in the airport. You know, Brian Platt, the city manager, wanted to have the streetcar going to the sports stadium, to Arrowhead Stadium, in time for the World Cup in 2026. What are the chances of that happening? Well, we don't anticipate okay. uh, streetcar to the stadiums by 2026, but I mentioned we're taking the important steps right now to develop consensus and a plan in a vision for east-west connectivity so that we can advance that plan, obviously, and that vision as soon as we're done doing the hard work, uh, building consensus, figuring out how we're going to pay for it, and accessing the federal resources to make it happen. Speaking of paying for things, you know, the streetcar is totally free, Donna, but with all of this extra work that has to, had to take place, something has to give. Is, this, you know, is there going to be one fewer streetcar on the line as a result of this? Some delay in that main street line or some compromise? No, our budget has, has been smartly built to incorporate capital improvements throughout our downtown and then our future Main Street extension. So now when we start service, you'll see the same number of streetcars and frequency. There has been a couple of stories in the last few days about climate change being a, an impact on what happened to the streetcar line here. But we have dozens of streetcar lines across the country, many of them in hot places, including in Arizona. We have them in Oklahoma City, new systems. Why aren't they seeing those same problems? And they, they're experience, he, experiencing heat too? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it is an issue of that is emerging in other locations. It's not an excuse for the failure that happened by itself. There's more, obviously, that that contributed, we think, to that 
a specific failure and we're looking closely at those details, but we do need to be cognizant of the design parameters around and the assumptions that we made 10 years ago about the resilience of our infrastructure are changing at a rapid pace. And so we're thinking about that with regards to the things we're building now to ensure that they can be resilient uh, regardless of how hot it might get. So if you've been waiting though to go on the streetcar, you can go likely, you're saying, this weekend. That's what we think. We think it's just hours away from being um, back and running. Donna Mandelbaum and Tom Guerin, thank you so much for being with us on Week in Review, updating us on the streetcar system. Up next, the rest of the week's news with our reporter roundtable. You're watching Kansas City Week in Review. Cleanup continues this week after storms ripped through the area, leaving around 200,000 people without power. The impact is still being felt with many neighborhoods still covered in downed trees. How bad was it? Local arborists say it's the worst tree damage they've seen in more than 20 years. With a report card on the responses, Kyle Palmer with the Shawnee Mission Post, former Kansas City Star reporter and editorial writer Dave Helling, and KMBC 9 political analyst Michael Mahoney. Kyle Palmer, I happened to be in Prairie Village over the weekend. It was like a war zone there. You must be one of the hardest hit areas in the entire metro. Yeah, it seemed like that area of Johnson County, particularly Prairie Village, Fairway, Mission, Roland Park, took a direct hit. My mother-in-law lives near 77th and Belinda. We were out on Saturday morning um, helping her clean up. She had three or four big branches down in her yard. It was a good day, a good weekend to have a friend or an uncle or a grandpa with a truck and a trailer because if you were able to have that like we did, uh, then you were able to kind of chop things up, get things chainsawed and moved out of there. But there are still huge piles of logs and debris and limbs spread out all across Northeast Johnson County right now. It's going to be days and weeks before it's fully cleaned on, up. On Twitter, Michael, I saw uh, quite a few disgruntled homeowners pointing the finger of blame at Energy and the city for that matter, saying they're not keeping up with tree trimming. That it could have, it wouldn't have to have been as bad as if they had done that. Is that fair? Um, Yes and no. Uh, one of the big parts of Evergy's uh, budget every year, a sizable chunk of it, is for tree trimming. Uh, but there are, they've got a big uh, service area, and uh, there are lots of trees in this part of the world and, and, and in Kansas, uh, Kansas City, so they can't get to them all, and uh, th this is the result of it. City Manager Bly Brian Platt actually responded, Dave, the storm had gusts over 80 miles per hour, which is the same as a Category 1 hurricane, meaning damage is hard to avoid, is he right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the hissing of summer chainsaws were everywhere in my neighborhood yeah. as the trees came down. I remember, Nick, uh, doing a, a story five or six years ago uh, about a conference in Kansas City of public works directors talking about climate change. And the main theme was it's not something that's coming, it's already here and we have to learn to deal with it. And I think utilities and cities and states and governments are going to have to adapt to a time of extreme weather events like this, not just in the summer but in the winter too, and pay the cost of tree trimming, tree removal. Uh, and other amelioration, if you will, of these kinds of So, models. Kyle, when it comes to your readers, what were they saying the city or the utility company, Evergy, could have done better? Yeah, I didn't hear a lot directed at Evergy. Evergy. We did have um, some residents and some city officials, frankly, in Overland Park, bring up the, the idea that the city uh, of Overland Park could have done more um, accommodating residents to, to pick up things curbside. I didn't hear a lot of anger directed at Evergy, but that could change as Evergy tries to um, increase rates in the coming months. <laughs> I love the letter in the paper this week um, in the Kansas City Star, Dave, from a reader by the name of Diane who said she was thrilled that because of what happened with the storm, she was going to have a lower Evergy bill because they were without power for so many days. That was a sort of forced savings. But I see this week also now that you might be seeing your bill go up because Evergy is now asking for a rate hike in Kansas because of that new Panasonic plant, which we talked about last week, that that's going to be their biggest customer. Yeah. all the infrastructure doing that right and that but they're also asking for increases out state of Kansas not just in our metro area and uh, utility rates are going up all over uh, the nation Nick in large part because people are going to alternative sources of energy and that leaves the big utility providers scrambling to try and figure out a way 
to keep uh, keep revenue coming in. One other quick note, Nick, Nick, I remember after an ice storm several years ago, I did a story on why more power lines aren't buried in our area, and what I was told by the utilities is burying existing lines is massively expensive, labor intensive, and very difficult. It takes 25 or 30 years to do a metropolitan area, so that's not uh, on the immediate horizon is a solution to a problem like the storm. It's had more lives than Jason in the Halloween movie series, but the City of Mission says it means it this time. This week, it ends the Mission Gateway deal after years of missed deadlines. The Mission City Council voted unanimously to terminate the agreement with the developer behind the project. We have been humiliated and disrespected uh, for years. We now have what we call the white albatross. That has been the laughing stock of this county since it went up. Now, just in case you're not aware, this is what some say is the most cursed piece of real estate in the entire metro. It was a thriving Johnson County Mall once upon a time, but for the last 17 years, it's been an unsightly hole in the ground right next to Shawnee Mission Parkway as a New York-based developer has promised to turn the prime site into everything from the region's biggest aquarium to one of Johnson County's most exciting entertainment districts, only to break every promise. So what happens now? Well, unfortunately for a lot of Mission residents and, and people li who live in North Johnson County, the immediate answer is not much. What do you uh, mean? I, I thought <laughs> we could finally put the nail in well, the coffin made, on this and we wouldn't have to talk about it again. You made the Jason analogy. I think a better um, 80s horror movie analogy <laughs> would be The Nightmare on Johnson Drive. Okay, <laughs> all right, all right. Um, well, it's currently tied up in a foreclosure lawsuit, so that's the other thing that's happening right now. Um, just a, you know, about a month ago, a New York bank moved to foreclose on that property because the New York-based developers had not um, started to pay back $26 million in loans. And so that's going to tie that property up. It's still privately owned. The city um, is going to have trouble buying it. That would also involve eminent domain. So unfortunately, right now, um, in the immediate term, as you're driving by that spot on Shawnee Mission Parkway, our mission residents grumbling about what's happening, not much is going to change on that site. Wow. It's going to continue to stay that way. It was staggering to me from the story that they, the city mission doesn't own the site, so they do have to wait for that, uh, the judge to rule on the foreclosure, which could take 18 months. You know, what is the best scenario at that point? You know, turn it into a park? Park seems uh, seems viable for right now. Um, you know, if they wanted to try and uh, convert it into office space, that's a very soft market right now. I don't know if that that would work. Um, you know, housing would be would be a possibility as well. But again, as uh, as Kyle said, nothing's going to happen here for in the immediate future. And as you mentioned, uh, Nick, that uh, this lawsuit's going to take another 18 months or so. Can you reveal a secret plan happening <laughs> behind the scenes, <laughs> Kyle, as to what's going to happen here? Well, I hear the Royals are looking for yeah. a yeah. state yeah. <laughs> The Mission Royals. We were just at the Mission City Council meeting last night. It was not about Mission Gateway, but they are all, they're facing their own uh, yeah. budget shortfall for 2024. They're about a million dollars in the hole. And so, I mean, just buying that property is not something that's practical right now for the city. So um, as much as local residents, I mean, probably rightfully so, want to see something done more immediately and maybe see the city be more aggressive in stepping in, they, their hands are tied. There will be books written about what went wrong here because other developments have come and gone and are now open and working well in Kansas and in Missouri. What went wrong with this particular uh, project seems to be a combination of uh, uh, misinformation, uh, bad guidance, economic factors. Uh, again, it is not a simple story, but this, this is an epic collapse in our area. And perhaps now that you're not with the star, you have the time to write that book, Dave. Well, Mahoney and I are going to work together on okay, that. Okay, all right. Retired people. So. How many entertainment districts can Kansas City support now that plans by the Kansas City Royals to build a new ballpark have gone quiet again? The Casey Current is moving forward with plans for an $800 million retail office and housing district right next to their new stadium being built on the Kansas City Riverfront. The 11,000-seat soccer venue is scheduled to be open in March. The Port Authority is offering to give the team's ownership group a free pass on all sales and property taxes for up to 15 years to make it happen. That's got people upset again about throwing around big public subsidies. But if there was a place to give public subsidies, 
Everybody's always complained nothing happens at the river. It's been abandoned. Is this a good place to, to make that happen? Longtime residents of, uh, uh, of the area and particularly the downtown and, the, and those neighborhoods will tell you to that, you know, nothing has happened down there for years and years and years. This is the sort of thing that can do it. But your question at the beginning, beginning of this is how many different sites like this, if the ballpark ends up uh, on the east side, there's power of light, then there would be the Royals uh, ballpark village, for lack of a better term, and then th this complex. And this, this Penway Point, which is by Union Station right. IRS it's, building with exactly. a Ferris wheel and all these other entertainment exactly. options that's, there. That's, a, that's a, lo a lot of fun in a, lot of, in a, in a <laughs> small area. <laughs> It's interesting though that this this doesn't get the same ire as say the, all, all we hear about uh, the downtown ballpark with the Royals, for instance. What, why is that, Dave? Why don't we hear the same type of criticism about uh, tax breaks being used well, in this you instance? Might, to a certain degree, I think there is some criticism of the Port Authority using its sort of unilateral ability to offer these tax breaks to this development. There's a lot going on actually in the riverfront. If you go down there from what it was when Mike and I were reporters and the tow lot was there, yeah. uh, you know, where there are abandoned cars everywhere and now there are apartments and some office buildings and a park and riverboat gaming at the east end, which was always a part of this. Um, but I think that as this goes forward, if the Royals propose something on the East Village site, uh, there will be more squawking about handing out these kinds of incentives to various sports teams for these things. The Women's World Cup is now underway in Australia and New Zealand, and Kansas City's Power and Light District is hosting World Cup watch parties to see the U.S. women play. The hoopla is a reminder that in just two years from now, the men's tournament will arrive in Kansas City, marked June 11th, 2026 on your calendar. That's when the first game is scheduled to be played. Other than bringing in Taylor Swift again, what does Kansas City need to do, Michael, to make this a successful event? Uh, provide a reliable, steady transportation from uh, downtown and at all points in the metro out to uh, out to Arrowhead Stadium. We, and, we know that's not going to be the streetcar because we just spoke to the head of it and they yeah, said that's not going to happen. Right, uh, right, and there and there won't be any sort of uh, uh, you know mass transit line. They're going to ha they're going to have to develop a, a, a pretty effective bus system. I I don't see any other option on it. I would caution everybody. We went through the NFL draft. Everybody complained. Uh, you know, local businesses didn't do so well. The World Cup may not be the complete panacea for the mom and pop stores that some people think it could end up being. We've talked a lot about the sort of Missouri side sports attachments, but there was a big push at one time to see something happen on the Kansas side. Do we see um, Johnson County leaders salivating over the prospect still of still trying to potentially attract the Royals or the Chiefs? Uh, if they are, I'm not seeing it. I think, um, you know, just saying in jest earlier about the Royals moving to Mission, I mean, there's the, the, the problem with at least that pocket of Johnson County is there's not a lot of infill development available, right? If you want to build something that big in Johnson County, you're going to have to go out to greenfield spaces probably far beyond where most fans are going to want to drive to. Now, I say that, and the San Francisco 49ers are actually in Santa Clara, so who knows? But um, I just, you know, I don't hear it a lot from county leadership. Um, I think they're much more interested in trying to build up places like the Shields Soccer Complex in South Overland Park or Blue Hawk also in South Overland Park that might be uh, regional amateur sports hubs for big tournaments. Now, with our streetcar newsmakers joining us this week, we have less time than usual for our regular roundup of news, so our next segment is even more important this week. What was the big story we missed? Three weeks after the Supreme Court affirmative action ruling, the Kansas and Missouri attorneys general making national news as they send letters to the heads of Fortune 100 companies, warning them of the legal consequences of race-based hiring. Fewer cops on the beat, a new Kansas City Police Department report says they're down 221 officers since 2019. The Jackson County assessment saga continues. The latest figures show more than 38,000 property owners have now appealed their assessments. That's about 12% of every house in the entire county. Remembering Bob Dole, the former Kansas senator and presidential candidate, would have turned 100 on Saturday, a big centennial party planned at KU. Alicia Keys makes good on that large gift. The Grammy Award-winning singer performs in St. Louis this weekend, and she's providing free transportation and concert tickets to every person in Ralph Yarl's school. He's the black teen who was shot in the head when he rang the wrong doorbell in North Kansas City. Around 1,500 students attend Staley High School, which makes this a gigantic-sized gift. 
and the Chiefs report to training camp in St. Joe. The team's first preseason game is just three weeks away. Already lots of amazing uh, options there, and we haven't even mentioned the man who caused mayhem at the Ford plant by calling in a security threat just to, so his friend wouldn't have to go to work. Or the city of Lawrence joining Kansas City in becoming the region's second transgender sanctuary city. But Kyle, it is your choice. Did you pick one of those stories or something completely different? I chose something completely different. So there's a, a brewing battle over, over zoning in Johnson County. And I say it now just because we are on the cusp of um, election season and there's uh, early voting starts on Saturday. People in elected positions of power in that city and beyond in the county as well who really want to take a serious look at zoning and trying to reform zoning practices open things up, maybe allow for more types of single family and multifamily housing. And there are entrenched interests in a lot of Northeast Johnson County and Johnson County cities writ large um, that don't want to see that or are very wary of that. And it was a, a, a factor in the mayor's race in Overland Park yeah. la last year. Uh, I, I'm picking the uh, Kansas City Police uh, uh, enrollment, their, their roster. Uh, However you want to approach the problem of uh, violent crime in th this area, not having a fully staffed police force for Kansas City, Missouri is an element of that. And for them to be down now uh, to uh, 2019 or less le uh, levels is something that they, they've got to address. Just quickly, it's not for lack of money. It's be, right. uh, other cities are facing this same problem of recruiting people for the police department. We'll see how it works out. Now, my uh, top story was the end of the current city council in Kansas City, Missouri. A new council will take over. The uh, council that is leaving office uh, will be known, I think, for three things. The airport, which, as it turns out, went fairly well. Um, COVID, the COVID response, which I think, uh, again, was relatively well handed in the metro area and in Kansas City, not without controversy, but was relatively well handled. And then, as Michael suggests, violent crime and the police problem, which is only uh, indirectly the responsibility of the city council, but some people in the public will blame them for it. And on that, we will say our week has been reviewed courtesy of Kyle Palmer of the Shawnee Mission Post and Channel 9's Michael Mahoney and news icon and former star reporter Dave Helling. And I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us here at Kansas City PBS, be well, keep calm and carry on.